The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Demystifying the Real World Evidence in Atrial Fibrillation, a comparative look at the direct oral anticoagulants for reducing the risk of stroke among patients with nonvalvular atrial fibrillation. Access the entire activity and complete the post test at peerview.com forward slash NNV860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello, I'm Dr. Steve Deidelswijk, Professor of Medicine at the University of Queensland in Ashner Clinical School, Chairman of Hospital Medicine and Medical Director of Regional Business Development with the Ashner Health System in New Orleans, Louisiana. This educational activity will show how real-world data and evidence augment the findings from randomized clinical trials of direct-acting oral anticoagulants for stroke prevention among patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation and compare the results of real-world studies with randomized studies and finally to apply this evidence to improve patient care. Atrial fibrillation is a common arrhythmia that is increasingly prevalent with age. Stroke is a frequent complication of atrial fibrillation and importantly, afib-related strokes cause larger areas of brain infarction greater disability, and mortality compared with strokes of other ideologies. Fortunately, AFib-related strokes are highly preventable using oral anticoagulants. Relative to placebo, oral anticoagulants reduce the risk of stroke by more than 64% and the risk of mortality by more than 25%. In the past, the terminology used to discuss AFib was a little unclear but updated guidelines from the AHA, ACC, and HRS now clarify that valvular AFib always includes patients with mechanical heart valves or moderate to severe mitral stenosis. These patients have always been excluded from trials of direct-acting oral anticoagulants. Some trials also exclude patients with bioprosthetic heart valves. However, about 20% of DOAC trial participants had valvular abnormalities, including mild mitral stenosis, aortic stenosis, or mitral aortic or tricuspid regurgitation. The 2019 AHA, ACC, HRS update also offers guidance for the newest DOAC, edoxaban. Alters the CHAS-2 VAS score at which OACs are recommended for men and women, and recommends testing renal and hepatic function before initiating a DOAC. The risk score criteria for stroke remains the CHAS-2 VASC, but OACs may be omitted for women with a score of zero or one, whereas men with a score of two or more, or any patient with ACS, acute coronary syndrome, or percutaneous coronary intervention, and a score of two or more should use an OAC unless the bleeding risk is greater than the benefit. Bleeding is, of course, the major adverse event or concern of any anticoagulant therapy. The scoring criteria for HASBLED and the corresponding treatment recommendations remain the same as they have since LIPS paper of 2011. The American College of Cardiology, or ACC, now offers a simple online tool for calculating chas 2 vasc and HASBLED scores from clinical data. It also performs the risk-benefit evaluation and presents its conclusion. The tool can also be downloaded as a phone app. It includes data for warfarin and all currently available DOACs, so you can easily compare the risks and benefits of different treatment options. All the information on chas 2 vasc HASBLED, and the Anticoag Evaluator link is available in a downloadable practice aid, and you'll see in the labeled pin in the navigation pane for this activity. With the addition of edoxaban, there are now four DOACs available in the U.S. that are approved to reduce the risk of stroke in AFib. Reversal agents are currently FDA-labeled for three of them, apixaban, rivaroxaban, and dabigatran. Patients with renal impairment may need to use DOACs at a reduced dose. For patients with end-stage kidney disease or who are on dialysis, dabigatran, edoxaban, and rivaroxaban are not recommended, but apixaban 
and warfarin may be used. Patients may ask why they can't just take an aspirin instead of an OAC. While an antiplatelet agent like aspirin is somewhat helpful in reducing stroke risk, warfarin is much more effective at reducing stroke risk. Numerous large cardiovascular outcome trials comparing the DOACs with warfarin have consistently shown that the DOACs are even more effective than warfarin in preventing strokes. But unfortunately, more than half of AFib patients in the U.S. were not using evidence-based anticoagulation as of 2012. Concern about bleeding risk is obviously one of the most frequently cited reasons for avoiding OACs, but how common is bleeding on these agents? In cardiovascular outcomes trials comparing DOACs with warfarin, fewer than 4% of patients per year had a major bleeding event by ISTH definition on any agent. Both the bigotran and rivaroxaban were about as likely to cause major bleeding as warfarin. However, a pixaban and edoxaban were associated with significantly less bleeding than warfarin. Intracranial bleeding is a particularly devastating potential complication of anticoagulant therapy. In trials comparing DOACs with warfarin, fewer than 1% of patients per year experience intracranial bleeding or consistently one half the risk of warfarin. However, real world data shows that under treating patients with AFib increases the risk of a first stroke about threefold relative to appropriately dosed anticoagulant therapy. Among patients with a prior stroke, under treating AFib is associated with a threefold risk of death relative to appropriately dosed anticoagulant therapy. Given the pervasive undertreatment of AFib and the risk of stroke and death associated with undertreatment, special efforts should be undertaken to ensure that neither clinicians nor patients have unreasonable fears about using anticoagulants when indicated. In a manner paralleling antibiotic stewardship that has facilitated more appropriate use of antibiotics by limiting overuse, the Anticoagulation Stewardship Program, which was launched in 2019, is aiming to facilitate more appropriate use of anticoagulants by correcting underuse. The FDA-funded Anticoagulation Forum to develop a comprehensive plan to healthcare systems and individual clinicians to collaborate to improve patient outcomes. You'll see a more detailed explanation of the core elements of anticoagulation stewardship in one of the downloadable practice aids associated with this activity. Let's turn to a case and apply current evidence to improve the care of a patient with long-standing AFib heart failure with reduced EF and chronic kidney disease. Camille is a new patient, a socially active woman of 71 years who enjoys woodworking. She was referred to you after her previous cardiologist moved out of the area. She doesn't have any current complaints, and her current exam doesn't reveal any new complications. She's currently taking six medications on a daily basis. Warfarin, three milligrams. Lisinopril, HCTZ, 20 milligrams, 12.5. Carvedilol, 6.25 mg's. Rosuvastatin, 20 milligrams, and aspirin, 81 milligrams. She takes acetaminophen, 500 milligrams, PRN, for occasional back and shoulder pain. You run Camille's clinical data through the anticoag evaluator to double check that she's using an appropriate dose of anticoagulant. Indeed, the benefits of an OAC outweigh the risks. However, you observe that her woodworking hobby increases the risk of cuts. Reducing her risk of bleeding while maintaining a socially active lifestyle is clearly a goal of care. Switching Camille from warfarin to a DOAC will reduce her risk of bleeding and further reduce her risk of stroke. You check the anticoag evaluator and find that after accounting for her renal status, she could use a pixaban or dabigatran at the full dose, or a doxaban or rivaroxaban at a reduced dose. But if randomized cardiovascular outcomes trials comparing DOACs with warfarin were our only source of evidence, we might find it difficult to determine whether there is strong reason for one of these DOACs over the other. So what is meant by the term real-world evidence? What difference can real-world evidence make if we already have well-designed RCTs or randomized control trials? RCTs are the gold standard for proving the efficacy 
of a medication. These trials are rigorous, randomized, and blinded, but these often come at a cost, and I just don't mean financial. They are only conducted in a subset of the patient population we'd ultimately like to use them in. RCTs also have structural features that would be very difficult to replicate in a typical clinical setting, like dedicated teams following up with the patients far more frequently than a typical office visit schedule. Patients may only participate in a clinical trial for six months or a year or two, but some of the medications we prescribe are intended to be used for decades. Consequently, there are often questions as to whether the results from an RCT are generalizable to a typical clinical population and whether the benefits observed in the short term are sustained for longer periods. Many of the limitations of RCTs are obviated by real-world studies. Real-world studies collect various types of data from actual clinical populations using routine clinical records. Very large numbers of patients can be observed for very long periods of time, which lets us determine whether a particular treatment is effective on the typical conditions of use and whether there are safety signals that might have been overlooked in smaller, shorter-term RCTs. Real-world studies let us take advantage of data that we're collecting anyway as part of routine care, but their biggest drawback is the potential for bias and confounders. For example, if a particular medication isn't widely available in rural parts of the country, a real-world study might include people who are older and of different race or ethnicity or educational background from the people who we'd find in metropolitan areas. If clinicians routinely avoid using a medication in patients with, say, moderate renal impairment, the real-world study results might not be the same for a dialysis clinic population. Controlling for the inevitable sources of bias that can affect real-world studies is extremely important. And if done well, we can obtain results that are similar in quality to what we get with RCTs. Some of the sources of bias in real-world studies are the same as you'd find in RCTs. Selection bias is one example. The results observed in the first patients to enroll in a study are used to determine which patients are recruited later in a study. Selective reporting is a problem for both RCTs and real-world studies. This happens when only the favorable or statistically significant outcomes are reported but other endpoints included in the study protocol are not reported, perhaps because they're inconsistent with the study hypothesis. Some sources of bias are more problematic in real-world studies than in RCTs. HRQ, or Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and Robin's Eye enumerate the type of bias from selection, detection, mortality, classification, and others. Classification is a particular problem in real-world studies where administrative data, such as the code associated with an imaging study, is used in place of the actual report from the imaging study, confirming or refuting the diagnosis to sort individuals with a particular disorder from those who do not have that disorder. Missing data bias is even more problematic in real-world studies than in RCTs, given that patients may not receive recommended follow-up tests of appropriate intervals, or may switch providers or insurance companies and become lost to follow-up. Real-world data is available from many sources. RWD can be collected from electronic health records, claims records, product or disease registries, patient-generated data from devices such as blood pressure cuffs, blood pressure monitors, or scale. And more recently, mobile devices such as activity trackers that can monitor health status. It is important to note that the US FDA makes a distinction between real world data and real world evidence. Real world data, RWD, is routinely collected data relating to patient health status and or healthcare delivery. Real world evidence, RWE, is RWD analyzed to obtain clinical evidence of the potential benefits and risk of a medical product. The FDA has also increased the amount of RWE it considers. The 21st Century Cures Act of 2016, with bipartisan support, mandates inclusion of RWE on benefits and risks 
from sources other than clinical trials. The FDA also notes that computers, mobile devices, wearables, other biosensors can gather and store huge amounts of data easily. And these large repositories of data can be analyzed quickly using increasingly available big data techniques. In the President's budget for fiscal year 2019, there is a $100 million proposal to build a medical data enterprise system using EHR or electronic health record data, including data from 10 million patients. It will build a foundation for more robust post-marketing studies and offer a richer source of RWD with a shorter reporting lag time than claims data. Clinicians will be relieved to hear that this proposed system will also address the lack of standardization of EHR data and the lack of interoperability between EHR systems. As anyone who has ever had to get patient records from an outside clinic can attest, this is one of the most frustrating limitations of current electronic health record systems. Potential benefits of the FDA's embrace of RWE using study designs that are pre-specified, rigorous, and use validated outcomes include more rapid addition of new indications for existing medications and lower research expense resulting in lower medication costs, as well as faster identification of rare safety signals. The FDA, insurance companies, medical societies, and pharmaceutical companies have been using RWD and RWE for a long time. The FDA has used RWD and RWE to monitor post-marketing safety, adverse events, and to make regulatory decisions. Insurance companies use RWD and RWE to support coverage decisions. Medical societies use RWD and RWE to develop clinical guidelines and treatment algorithms. Pharmaceutical companies use RWD and RWE to support clinical trial designs. Pharmacoepidemiology studies are observational studies that examine how drugs are used and their effects in populations. FDA has substantial experience in evaluating and providing guidance on pharmacoepidemiology studies for use RWD for the purposes of evaluating drug safety. The FDA has already outlined its perspective on using RWD available in electronic healthcare data systems, medical claims, and EHRs for safety studies in pharmacoepidemiologic guidance. The FDA has developed a RWD repository called the Sentinel System. The FDA supported a randomized trial using data from the Sentinel System to test whether a patient and provider educational intervention can increase anticoagulant use for individuals who, per the data within the Sentinel System, have atrial fibrillation and are at increased risk of stroke. Not only is this a critical public health question, it is also a proof of concept trial for conducting interventional effectiveness trials using the Sentinel infrastructure. The results of the RCT Impact AF were reported in 2017 and showed that patients who were exposed to the educational initiative cut their risk of stroke by 52% over one year. We need to think of RCTs and RWEs, not RCTs versus RWDs. We need the clinical depth and insights provided by both. So could RWE replace RCTs entirely or at least substantially? It's very unlikely. A recent study looked at all the U.S.-based RCTs published in high-impact journals in 2017 and assessed how feasible it would be to replicate these trials using administrative claims or EHR data. The authors concluded that only 15% of the RCTs could be replicated using these sources of data. Both types of evidence are needed. Which medication works best is a common clinical question, one that is relevant to DOAX and one that RWD is well suited to answer. Head-to-head -head RCTs could be used to answer this question, but they are lacking. Adequately powered, in other words, large real-world studies of existing medications offer insight into comparative effectiveness. And of course, the outcomes of interest must be present within the data set studied, and the study itself must be designed in a pre-specified and transparent way. In observational studies, it can be very difficult to discern which variables are influencing the outcome. We have commonly employed tools like regression, 
and PSM, or propensity score matching. The Cox regression mathematical model can control for multiple known confounders on the time it takes to a specific event or hazard to occur. Propensity score matching is a popular technique for reducing selection bias. Because observational studies are not randomized, the baseline characteristics of the groups using different treatments are almost certain to differ. PSM is a statistical approach to construct matched samples of treatment control pairs to minimize differences between the two groups. Done properly, real-world studied quality can approach that scene in RCT. CMS, or the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, maintains the largest administrative claims database that includes almost the entire U.S. population aged 65 years or older, which is precisely the population with the highest prevalence of AFib. Graham et al. performed the pharmacoepidemiology study of the CMS database on behalf of the FDA's Center for Drug Evaluation Research. They identified about a half a million patients in that database who had been treated with warfarin or one of three DOACs, apixaban, dubigatran, or rivaroxaban. Since this study was done on patients identified between 2010 and 2015, the doxaban was excluded since it hasn't been approved yet. From this population, patients with similar baseline characteristics were selected and followed for one year. The smallest patient cohort, the apixagran group, had more than 72,000 patients in it, and the largest, the warfarin group, had more than 183,000 patients in it. These are massive numbers of patients that would be impossible to recruit into a randomized cl clinical trial. Graham et al. found that the risk of stroke was higher with warfarin than with any of the three DOACs. Clearer differences were observed in the risk of major bleeding with the DOACs. The risk of major bleeding, not including intracranial bleeding, was highest with rivaroxaban, intermediate with warfarin and dubigatran, and lowest with apixaban. Intracranial hemorrhage risks favored dubigatran over rivaroxaban and dubigatran. No significant difference was found for rivaroxaban versus apixaban. Mortality outcomes were more favorable for dubigatran or apixaban than for rivaroxaban. No significant difference was found for dubigatran versus apixaban. An even larger, and in fact the largest to my knowledge, pharmacoepidemiology study has been performed. The Aristophanes study, of which I am a principal investigator, include a CMS database plus four large databases maintained by various commercial insurers. The combined database include more than 180 million patients, representing about 56% of the entire U.S. population. From this very large database, individual pairs of patients with similar baseline characteristics were identified as using warfarin or one of three DOACs during 2013 to 2015, then followed for one year. After the original publication of this study in 2018, it was discovered that the complete CMS database had not been used, and a correction was issued. In the original publication, the smallest cohort matched to warfarin was the bigotran group, with more than 26,000 patients, and the largest cohort matched to warfarin was the rivaroxaban group, with more than 83,000 patients. In the corrected publication, these numbers increased to more than 36,000 and more than 125,000, respectively. In the DOAC versus DOAC groups, there were about 27,000 patients in the apixaban dubigatran and the dubigatran rivaroxaban matched groups, and more than 62,000 patients in the apixaban rivaroxaban matched group. In the corrected publication, these numbers increased to about 37,000 and 107,000, respectively. The stroke outcomes for the DOACs versus warfarin in the original publication favored all the DOACs. Warfarin was always associated with a higher risk of stroke than apixaban, dubigatran, or rivaroxaban. Warfarin was also associated with a higher risk of major bleeding than apixaban or dubigatran. Rivaroxaban and warfarin had similar major bleeding outcomes. 
comparing the DOACs against each other in the original publication of Pixaban had lower risk of stroke than either dabigatran or rivaroxaban. Stroke outcomes for dabigatran and rivaroxaban were similar. But Pixaban also had lower risk of major bleeding than dabigatran or rivaroxaban, but dabigatran had lower risk of major bleeding than rivaroxaban. The corrected data set, though much larger, reflected similar findings. Point estimates of the hazard ratios changed minimally with the addition of the full CMS data set. Importantly, none of the key findings from the original publication changed substantially after correction to include a complete CMS data set. They were directionally similar. The point estimates of the hazard ratios generally shifted slightly, but not enough to alter the clinical, practical interpretation of the findings. Intracranial hemorrhage outcomes consistently favor the DOACs over warfarin. Comparing DOAC versus DOAC, a pixaban or dabigatran was superior to rivaroxaban, and a pixaban was equivalent to dabigatran. Viewing the results from cardiovascular outcomes trials side by side with Aristophanes, we note that the RCTs generally have numerically lower rates of stroke and major bleeding than in the real world study. So let's consider how we can apply the evidence from randomized trials and real world evidence to a case. Andrew is an 82 year old man with AFib and a history of stroke and hypertension who was recently admitted to the hospital following a GI bleed. Other than a regularly irregular heart rate, a hallmark of AFib, his examination results are all within normal limits. He is currently taking rivaroxaban, aspirin, ticagrelor, candesartan, and carvedilol. Despite his recent GI bleed, the anticoag evaluator still shows that the benefits of an OAC outweigh the risks of bleeding, and evidence suggests to start within one to two weeks. But is rivaroxaban the best choice for Andrew? The anticoag evaluator states that rivaroxaban is associated with a 3.3% per year risk of major bleeding. This value is lower than was seen in the cardiovascular outcomes trial, 3.6% per year, and in the full population of Aristophanes, around 5 to 6% per year. A pixaban is consistently associated with a lower risk of major bleeding relative to warfarin, rivaroxaban, or dabigatran. Based on the anticoag evaluator, a pixaban would reduce his risk of major bleeding to 2.6% per year, and the Aristophanes study suggests it would reduce his major bleeding risk from between 5 to 6% per year to something around 3 or 4% per year. Therefore, it would seem reasonable to switch him from rivaroxaban to a pixaban. Importantly, Andrew should not be on aspirin therapy after a major GI bleed. I hope that you have found today's presentations to be helpful. We've covered a lot of new information and new concepts in clinical evidence. In addition to this audiovisual presentation, you will find a selection of practice aids under one of the tabs in the navigation panel. Thank you for your time and attention. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash NNV860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Bristol Myers Squibb and Pfizer Alliance.